Hello, Booktube. I went to the Brattle Bookshop first thing this morning, bitterly early. I was out uh, with the Lark. <laughs> I was on I was on Boston's public transportation for its first squeaky clean run of the day. <laughs> oh. And eventually, my morning progressed so that the Brattle Bookshop on uh, in downtown Boston was open for business. And they are those of you who are new to the channel. They're a fantastic used bookstore, one of the only ones left in in greater Boston, uh, with constant churning overturn of stock on all three floors and a sale lot next door that's huge. So you're, you know, you, you might be familiar with used bookstores that have a barrel or two of moldy old books outside and the Brattle, uh, takes that to the max. <laughs> they have a whole lot, a whole floor plan of another building, uh, full. Of bargain books, one dollar, three dollars, and five dollars, uh, thousands of them. So you can easily shop out there to the exclusion of shopping anywhere else. And I pretty much did that today. I think I bought one book inside the shop, all the rest of them were from outside. Uh, and that means I got them for dirt cheap. And I want to show them to you. <laughs> I got, I typically the Brattle is such a great hunting ground, and you could go every day. That's how often the stock changes and how much there is to see. So you could easily miss things. Uh, typically at, at the Brattle, especially outside in the sale lot, I have the best possible indicator. I use the best possible yardstick of when it's time to stop. And that is when I've picked out so much that that's as much as I can carry. That's great. When you're at a used bookstore and your limit is how much you can carry instead of how much you can spend, you're at a good used bookstore. Uh, so I've got a bunch of books that I want to show you. We'll start off with two murder mysteries. This is the month of March Mystery Madness, when myself and a whole bunch of other booktubers are getting together to praise murder mysteries, wide and far, all different kinds. Uh, and the Brattle has a large amount of murder mysteries, not only a huge amount outside in the sale lot, but a huge amount inside the shop. So there's always something to look for, and I'm always struck by the infinite variety of of murder mysteries that I, you you never know what you're gonna what you're gonna encounter. Uh, I myself have developed a bit of a sweet tooth for village English village murders, where the, the organist gets killed and that starts a, a chain of nefarious events that ends up with either another organist getting killed or someone else getting killed who's not, in fact, an organist. <laughs> uh, and I got two of those today. Um, one of them is an author that we've already heard that we've already seen in this regard. This is uh, Sheila Radley. This is Death in the Morning. There's a an intrepid crime solver right there. This is part of a, a line called Murder, Inc. Uh, that I think I have a couple of others. And this is set in, yeah, uh, Ashtorp was a quiet English village. Charming old houses, winding country roads, a simple way to live. Mary Gedge was a beautiful young girl with a bright future until she was found floating down the river, just like Ophelia, a simple way to die. Chief Inspector Quantrell, I, we, I, I got another Chief Inspector Quantrell uh, murder mystery by this author, but I don't think it had that uh, logo. I'm, I don't. It might have been a Murder Inc. title, but I don't think it, it had that particular image. Uh, but Chief Inspector Quantrill doesn't know how, much about Shakespeare, but he had always known how to do his job. In this instance, one thing was certain: it wouldn't be a simple case to solve. And there is the poor victim. Uh, so this was a case where I know the author because I have found at least one other murder mystery by her, and that, that's always that's always interesting for me to see what kind of commonalities would be involved, because there's so many mystery authors that I don't know about. that I, they, they worked for years, they generated a whole shelf of books, I've never heard of them before. It's not like, uh, for instance, science fiction, where, where uh, you plop me down in the middle of any kind of author, and I'm probably going to know either their work or work right to the left or right of them. But Murder Mysteries, I'm still learning the genre. Uh, and the same thing is true. This next one is also a Murder, Inc. title. Uh, and it also is an author that uh, whose name is known to me, but not because I've bought another Murder Mystery by this author, because this is the only one the author ever wrote. Now, in fact, this name is known to me for other reasons, as it may be known to you. This is The Red House Mystery by A. A. Mill, who wrote Winnie the Pooh. Uh, it's famous for, for Winnie the Pooh. And the Red House Mystery is famous for something else as well. 
in addition to being the only murder mystery written by the author of Winnie the Pooh, this book is also raked over red-hot coals in a great protracted essay called The Simple Art of Murder by Raymond Chandler. A great essay. Just must-reading for mystery fans. To find a copy of that, I'm sure there are free copies online. And read it. Uh, and he, he takes many authors to task by name, specifically in details of their plots and books, uh, he doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't clothe anything in anonymity. Uh, and he has a good go at this book. <laughs> and, and I know A.A. A. Milne because of Winnie the Pooh. And I know A.A. A. Milne's book, this particular book because of that essay, which I love. But I don't think I've ever read this mystery. <laughs> I think it's just sort of sat there on the periphery the whole time. So when I found it, you know, mass market paperback, I, I grabbed it. Uh, and then we have, uh, those were the only paperbacks. Then there are a bunch of hardcovers. And one of the rules that I have repeated for you at the Brattle, just on the off chance that you ever get there, is that you can't impose your will on the outdoor sale lot. The outdoor sale lot is not organized in any way except by price. The staff doesn't know where things are. Don't bother to ask them. <laughs> Nobody else does. They're not organized in any way by size or category or anything like that. And they're constantly refreshed. So you never know what you're going to find out there. And it is a capital offense to bring an agenda to that lot. It will not only ensure that you don't find the thing you're looking for, it'll ensure that you don't find anything you want. The, the, uh, the gods of the Brattle Cart are generous but strict. They have their own rules. And one is you don't tell them what to do. <laughs> and, and that isn't the same thing as just innocently, idly shopping at the carts and noticing a theme that crops up. You still can't get your hopes up. Even if you start to notice a theme, you can't start looking for that theme, or that will ruin everything. <laughs> and another thing, uh, another rule of the Brattle Cards that I found often works really well is uh, to be open to what themes the cards are suggesting. To just go in with a wide open mind. If you, and, and the cards show you a particular book, and then they show you another particular book that's roughly connected to it in some way, then you start to think, okay, well, I'm totally up for this. I'm totally open to whatever it is this is going to be. Uh, and a little of that happened today. There's a theme that you're going to notice in some of the rest of the books that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a few books first that don't have that theme. Uh, so it's just, just in case. And the first one is an unlikely purchase by me. It's not the sort of thing I usually do. I, I leave it to other uh, book enthusiasts and also a few booktubers who love not only books, but the but nice, pretty editions of books, whether it's collectible or, you know, uh, aesthetic or, or whatever. I usually don't care about such things, uh, but A, everything that's in the Brattle sale lot is cheap. And B, this one really struck me. This is a work that I really like, and this one really struck me. I don't, I, I don't collect slipcase illustrated box editions or anything like that. I don't. I know that a lot of rest of you do, but I don't. But this one, this one I grabbed. This is the Travels of Marco Polo. I think it might have been that text that that attracted my eye. This is in a box set, and uh, when I took it, first of all, the first thing I noticed that I notice on all box sets, I test it right away, is how easy it comes out of the box. Because I've lost so many boxes for box sets by fighting with them until I ripped them apart. <laughs> this, as you saw, slides right out. And uh, one of the things I noticed about this is that it is the manual Komroff translation. Uh, and uh, Komroff took the, the, all the best parts of, I think, the two... English language translations of Marco Polo that had come before him and and added to them, improved them. So his is a good translation. It's a translation of the... I've read a few translations of this book, and I really like his. Uh, so I noticed that right away, but I also noticed that this is illustrated throughout in a lovely kind of suggestive way. Uh, it's these little uh, almost wash doodles that run throughout, and... Uh, they occur very often. There are, there are no, as far as I can tell, there are no full page illustrations, but there are spot illustrations everywhere. And I really like that. I, I, I really, I don't know anything about the artist. The artist is, is Nikolai Lapshin. I, I don't know anything about him. I think this is from the 1920s, this translation. Uh, and it starts off with, uh, 
the uh, the translator writing in, in the introduction, he starts off, After an absence of 26 years, Marco Polo and his father Niccolo and his uncle Maffeo returned from the spectacular court of Kublai Khan to their old home in Venice. Their clothes were coarse and tattered, the bundles they carried were bound in eastern cloths, and their bronzed faces bore evidence of great hardships, long endurance, and suffering. They had almost forgotten their native tongue. Their aspect seemed foreign, and their accent entire ma and entire manner bore the strange stamp of the Tartar. During their 26 years, Venice too had changed, and the travelers had difficulty in finding their old residence. But here at last they entered the courtyard and were home. Back from the deserts of Persia, back from the lofty, the lofty steeps of Pamir, from the mysterious Tibet, from the dazzling court of Kublai Khan, from China, Mongolia, Burma, Siam, Sumatra, Java, back from Ceylon, where Adam had his tomb, and back from India, the land of myth and marvels. But the dogs of Venice barked as the travelers knocked on the door of their old home. The polos had been long thought dead, and the distant relatives who occupied the house refused admittance to these three shabby and suspicious-looking gentlemen. After much questioning, finally the travelers took advantage of a moment when the bolt was drawn and beat their way into the house, dragging their bundles with them. Other relatives were brought from various parts of Venice, and after much talk, the three polos, who had long been counted among the dead, finally succeeded in convincing their own kindred that they were not impostors. The news soon spread, and great excitement reigned. The day or, a day or two later, a grand feast was arranged, to which all the old friends and relatives were asked. The three travelers were clothed, or were clothed in long robes of crimson satin, but these they removed before they sat down to the feast, and they put on other robes of crimson damask while the first were cut up and the cloth divided among the servants. Once, during the course of the meal, the travelers left the room and came back, this time in long robes of crimson velvet, and the damask garments were, pre were presented uh, to some of the guests. When the dinner was finished, the robes of velvet were removed, and the travelers appeared dressed in the ordinary fashion of the day, and the velvet robes were likewise distributed to the guests in the strict accordance with the Mongol custom. This performance caused much wonder, but when the table had been cleared and all the servants had been asked to retire from the hall, Marco Polo produced the coarse, shabby costumes which the three travelers had worn on their arrival. Then, taking sharp knives, they ripped the seams and pleats and let fall to the table quantities of rubies, carbuncles, sapphires, diamonds, emeralds, pearls, and other jewels of great value. <laughs> they had that treasure sewn into their, into their, their shabby old garments. Uh, I have the Penguin Classic. Uh, of the travels of Marco Polo, and I have a very interesting sort of retelling of them that isn't a translation. It's it's more like a narratization of, of whatever Marco Polo did. I don't have much else, considering how much I love this book and dote on it. I, I don't have many other versions, so I was, I was very happy to find this, even if it is kind of a you know a, 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 a collectible in a set. I'm still I'm still willing to take it definitely. Uh, I will just. I will use it probably with a lot more force and roughness than the people who really like collectible set books will will appreciate. <laughs> It'll be well loved, is what I'm saying. Uh, then this next one was a real find, and uh, one of the goals of shopping at the Brattle, for me, is to get books that will come in this room. Real keepers, the ones that come in here, to the little book room that I make wherever I go, wherever I have, wherever I lay me down my head, I make a little book room. Usually I try to find a very tiny space and just fill the walls with books. Uh, and the books are keepers. I like to think. I hope they are. And the one kind of turnover that happens in those keeper books is to upgrade the copy. And I have a book. I've praised it on this channel many times. We haven't gotten it yet to it in the Library Tour of Doom, but we will. Uh, it's by... It's edited by Catherine Washburn and John Major, and Clifton Fadiman is the, is the general editor of the whole thing. And it's this thing. It's World Poetry. Big, fat anthology of poetry from all times and all places. Uh, that is one of my favorite poetry anthologies. And I have a trade paperback up on the shelf there that is reinforced and stuffed with stuff and falling apart because of how often I go back to this anthology. And I have never until today seen it in hardcover. At a used bookstore. Never. I'm always... I, I think the one that I have up on the shelf, the trade paperback, is itself my third copy. But I always only ever find trade paperbacks. 
uh, which are, you know, nice and neat, but this is much more durable, and I cried aloud when I saw it. Somebody, somebody must have got rid of this to the brattle, and I can't help but notice there are a couple of bookmarks. This is the kind of book, this is the kind of anthology you go back to over and over again, at least I do. So let's see, let's see what the previous owner, uh, there are two bookmarks here. Okay, one is from uh, uh, Ancient Irish, Ancient Irish uh, verse. One of the things I love about this anthology is that they tap many different translators to do it. Uh, like, for instance, Robert Graves, Flann O'Brien, Seamus Heaney are all translated on this same page. Uh, but there's one here. Let's do one. I don't know which poem on this page the person uh, noticed. But one of the poems on, on the first page, the first bookmark, is anonymous. It's from AD 800, thereabouts. And the title that's given to it is On the Viking Raids. Since tonight the wind is high, the sea's white mane of fury, I need not fear the hordes of hell coursing the Irish Channel. That translation is by Frank O'Connor, uh, and it's obviously about the Vikings. That's, that's really neat. That's really neat. The, the person is looking at the weather and thinking, okay, I get a reprieve. It's a horrible night, so they won't be coming. Uh, but let's see, what, let's see what the second is. Uh... Okay, this, the, the section is from 18th to 20th century. Uh, who is the poet? Who is the poet? Georg Heim, H-E-Y-M. Any of you know that name? H-E-Y-M? I don't know that poet. 1887 to 1912 is his lifespan. Good Lord, he hardly lived at all. He was very, very young when he died. Now I want to know about him. Uh... Well, this, there's only one uh, of his poet poems that's open here. Okay, but on the next page is Giuseppe Belli, uh, who lived from 1791 to 1863. And there are two Giuseppe Belli poems on the facing page that are both translated by Anthony Burgess. Uh, but I'm going to assume that it's uh, Georg Hain that this person wanted. There's one here called Final Vigil, translated by Peter Verick. Uh, this final vigil is how dark the veins of your temples, heavy, heavy your hands, deaf to my voice, already in sealed off lands. Under the light that flickers, you are, you are so mournful and old, and your lips are talons clenched in a cruel mold. Silence is coming tomorrow, and possibly underway, the last rustle of garlands, the first air of decay. Later the night will follow, emptier year by year, here, here where your head lay, and gently ever your breathing was near. Oh, okay, well, and final vigil there refers to, to sitting with the dead, which doesn't happen anymore in, in America. It doesn't happen anymore. Once upon a time, it happened everywhere where you sat with the dead um, before they're taken away. Wow, that is really good. I wonder if that's translated. Oh, well, no, it is translated, because the author is the Peter Vick translated it. Uh, wow, that is fantastic. Silence is coming tomorrow and possibly underway. The last rustle of garlands, the first air of decay. Later the night will follow, emptier year by year. Here where your head lay, and gently ever your breathing was near. Wow. Okay, very good. Well, anyway, I'm, what I'm going to do with this thing is I'm going to, of course, work my way through it a bit because I don't ever leave this thing alone. Uh, and then I'm going to pull down my battered old trade paperback and take everything out of it. There are all sorts of clipped articles and bookmarks and whatnot uh, and transfer it all to this. And then I will have this as a hardcover. So that's great. That was the find of the day. Uh, but then we have uh, a bird book. I love bird books. This one is from 1915. I think this is from the National Geographic Society. Uh, is very old. I almost missed it when I was prowling through the shelves until I noticed that in addition to uh, ranges and general natural history, this is also uh, has beautiful paintings of all of the uh, just the quintessential birds of North America. There are photographs as well, but there are also these beautiful paintings. Uh, sometimes several on a page that I just love absolutely love them and the uh oh wow look at that look at that the cooper's hawk has a dead robin wow i've got i've got two of those just a minute away from where i live there's a morning dove those are everywhere where i live just everywhere um 
Frida is forever sparking them up off the ground where they're doing God knows what. They don't, they don't act like normal birds, and they don't sound like normal birds either. She, uh, she scares them up out of nowhere. Oh, wow, there's a great horned owl with a squirrel. Look at that, with the, with the low clouds and the band of light in winter. That is lovely. I wonder if it tells me who the illustrator is. Back then, a lot of times, uh, books like this did not tell you who the illustrator was, and that would be a shame. No, it doesn't right away, it doesn't right away, you know, uh, bandy about the illustrator, but uh, I'm sure that I can find out, because as you can see, they are signed. There are, there are uh, initials, so. But anyway, this is, this is just lovely. I'm, I have a, a sweet tooth for bird books anyway, but when the illustrations are that good, uh, then I'm all on board. Uh, and then, uh, you, you, the gentle thrumming that you hear is the, the nearing of our theme. <laughs> well, this is the first one is something that I got for the pictures, although as soon as I got it back there, I realized I don't have a copy, illustrated or not. So <laughs> I was very happy. I made a last-minute choice for this thing. This is the one that I bought inside. This is Hiawatha, the song Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and it's illustrated by Harrison Fisher. And just a lovely, a lovely hardcover, and the illustrations are mind-bogglingly good. There's the lovely daughter of Nokomis. <laughs> uh, they're just mind-bogglingly good. What? When did this come out? Uh, uh, 1906. 1906. This particular edition came out. So you've got illustrations all along the table of contents, and then uh, little spot illustrations, and also full full page, excuse me, illustrations throughout. Just lovely. There's, <laughs> there's, uh, that's almost a Gibson girl. <laughs> I guess it, that was the fashion of the time. This is just lovely. I mean, you get the poem, but the, the poem often tempted elaborate illustrated editions. I've never seen one as pretty as this. Uh, and I love it. Absolutely love it. No, I'm chunks of it by heart, but I, I love it anyway. Uh, <laughs> there's Hiawatha just sort of idly contemplating uh, this is going to be great to go through again I'll have to make sure to, that it isn't so delicate that it's falling apart I don't want to destroy it but uh, but I'm gonna if I if if it's gonna happen then it's gonna happen because I'm not I'm rough on my books so uh, but then this next one uh, is the life and letters of Henry Lee Higginson uh, by Bliss Perry, who was who ought to ought to have a life and letters of his own. Probably he does have one out there, and I just haven't found it. Uh, Henry Lee Higginson was a peculiar figure. He was autocratic in nature. He is the subject of a, a typically gorgeous John Singer Sargent portrait that really is immortal. It will outlive him. In fact, that that portrait might be in here. This might be old enough. Uh, yeah, not in color, but that is the portrait. And there you see he's he's leaning back, one arm over the back of the chair, eyes lidded a little closed. That the pose is meant to convey uh, absolute certitude, and that is correct. <laughs> that is that is accurate. Uh, Higginson he had, he had an enormous talent for making money, and he was embarrassed by that his whole life. Every time he tried to get away from that, straightened circumstances would drive him back to some sort of mercantile or economic. Uh, turn of employment and immediately he would blossom. <laughs> but he was at heart a philanthropist. He was at heart a patron of the arts. Specifically the Boston Symphony Orchestra here in Boston, which was his sole creation. And his sole underwriting for so many of its earliest years, he would just underwrite the expenses of the whole symphony. I have often... Uh, griped uh, Higginson the major was not a likable man <laughs> it was not I, I'm sure that I've had this volume before a couple of times and got rid of it to people but usually to Boston Symphony Orchestra fans uh, I plan on keeping this volume and I, I know that at the end of this volume if you plow your way through and I don't imagine there's anybody aside from me who's alive today who will you end up kind of sort of grudgingly liking the guy but in life he was unlikable the major was not likable at all. He knew what he liked, and he liked what he knew, and didn't tolerate disobedience, <laughs> even from people who didn't technically work for him. 
Uh, but that's a, you take the good with the bad in any case. And in his case, he did a huge amount more good in his life than bad, including a huge amount of good for Boston Symphony Orchestra. So when I, in the old days before the pandemic, when I would walk people around Boston, I would be irritated uh, by the fact that I have to show them Symphony Hall. That I have to show them beautiful a beautiful building called Symphony Hall. Who calls their building Symphony Hall? Boston is just horrible in that in that one area of Copley. That the, the with these buildings that have descriptions as their titles, that's not that's not right at all. That should be Higginson Hall. Uh, if if we can have a, if we can have a music shed at Tanglewood named after Seiji Ozawa, who has no talent at all and had no talent for 150 years as music director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, I think we could probably call the building Higginson Hall, but we don't. <laughs> but anyway, one way or another, um, he was uh, a fixture in Boston, as was Bliss Perry. Uh, Bliss Perry's books are wonderful, and all of his writings are wonderful. And I'm kind of hoping you can see the theme here, right? Which is Boston. Uh, and I'm kind of hoping that maybe these were all snatched from the same attic or basement somewhere. And that maybe some Bliss Perry might be among the books that are in that by that I might get a chance to... to... Bliss, Bliss Perry, if I remember correctly, wrote a memoir that was fantastic. Just fantastically entertaining. But I don't think I've ever seen it outside of two or three very old New England libraries in their permanent collections. Uh, but one way or another, uh, we're not straying from Boston for the rest of this book. <laughs> and that is that was the theme, but I was very quiet. Even in my mind, when I was there, I was thinking, well, all right, I'm noticing a commonality here, but I'm not going to expect anything. If I start to expect things, it'll dry up. It'll go away. I found this thing a, a keeper and also a, a bit of a collectible thing, I have to imagine. This is a book made of the speeches and addresses done for a commemoration of the centenary of the birth of James Russell Lowell. If that isn't, if that isn't too entirely Boston for you. Uh, has a, uh, I believe a picture at the front. Yes, there is James Russell Lowell. Those of you with long memories of this channel will remember him because we have met him before. <laughs> I have, I have a two volume life and letters of James Russell Lowell. Uh, and I also have a, a book, a wonderful sort of collective biography before that was such a thing, by Edward Everett Hale, another uh, massive prominent figure in Boston literary history, wrote a book called James Russell Lowell and His Friends, because James Russell Lowell had a genius for friendship. And that book is delightful. And that book, it came out as a hardcover, and then it was reprinted, and then it was reprinted again. But I think later on, it got a relatively much later trade paperback reprint. That book did. This will never be repent. This is just, this is just a freakish thing. The kind of thing you're going to find at a shop like the Brattle that you're not going to find anywhere else, because this prints the speeches. the The foremost speaker was Elihu Root, who was the political genius uh, behind both Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. Uh, but another one of the speeches. I wonder if I can show it to you. Another one of the speeches uh, is by Barrett Wendell. We've already met. <laughs> We've already met him in uh, a different one of these old Boston book excursions. Edward Lee Masters also in here. Edgar Lee Masters was the uh, Spoon River Anthology. Uh, and uh, the probably the most famous speaker was John Galsworthy. Uh, but Elihu Root's speech will be the best in this. I don't... Where else are these things recorded? Nowhere. So... Uh, if I want to know what sort of talks were given about James Russell Lowell at that that whole weekend event to commemorate his, the centenary of his birth, he was once so prominent in American letters that you could have an event like that and a whole crowd of people would show up. You do a sesquicentennial now or a bicentennial now and no one would show up. <laughs> Me, I would show up alone in a mask. <laughs> so I was very happy to find this thing. Good Lord. Uh, uh, James Russell Lowell was a, a, the, just a preeminent kind of man of letters. Uh, so this this book will be invaluable to read right alongside both the two-volume Life and Letters that I have and also James Russell Lowell and His Friends by Edward Everett Hale. And, and he comes up, of course, in books about... in books and reminiscences about his nephew. Uh, 
who died in the Civil War, died as a young man in the Civil War. Um, and Charles Russell Lowell was amazing. He was amazing. There wasn't anyone who met him that didn't think that. There were hardly any people who met him that didn't think, just know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he would be president one day, and he didn't. He didn't live, uh, and nobody really got over that. No, the world was never quite the same when he left. After he left it, uh, stolid, you know, slab-faced killers among the general staff, among his general staff during the war, when they heard that he had been killed were reduced to helpless tears. And all of Boston was reduced to mourning when word spread back to Beacon Hill. Uh, but the, uh, the, I didn't find anything about him today. That's all right. I have plenty about him. But I, the last thing I found is a two volume life and letters, <laughs> a gigantic two volume life and letters of Edward Everett Hale <laughs> done by uh, his son. It's just this, this huge uh, ornate, Thing also from the teens of, of let me get you a, of the Boston literary figure and preacher Edward Everett Hale. Let me get you a, see if there's a, a picture that I can show you of his perpetually worried face. Uh, no, oh no, yeah, there is that is Edward Everett Hale <laughs> in later life. That's what he was, uh, although unlike uh. <laughs> so I should, unlike James Russell Lowell, Edward Everett Hale was not uh, a super hottie when he was at Harvard. <laughs> when he was when he was in school, he was not. He was all, he always looked pretty much like that, only without the whiskers. But here's his birthplace, at the extreme corner of Tremont and School Street. I could take you right there uh, today if, 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 if there were possible to do. So this is the whole. Uh, thing this this used to be the standard way to do a biography in American letters was the life and letters so that the letters lard out the thing enormously and this also has tons and tons of uh, reproduced documents inset in the pages and also uh, photographs and whatnot uh, Edward Everett Hale I think is completely forgotten now he has a great big life-size statue in the public garden here in Boston and the most, I think, that would be his claim to fame now would be that he wrote a little story called A Man Without a Country. But I don't know if people, I don't know if school children are even forced to read that story anymore. They might not be. In which case, he would be gone forever. He would be gone completely. Uh, and the combination of all of these things, uh, the, all of these Boston books, just dug at me a little because uh, uh, a couple of you have, have commented over the years that when I bring out these old Boston dinosaurs and I say that, that Boston was once the pinnacle of literary brilliance and full of great characters in the literary landscape, uh, a lot of you uh, over the years have said, you know, instead of just commenting on these things and collecting these books, maybe you ought to write a Charles Russell Lowell biography, a new one. And make your case for a new generation. Make the case that these people are unjustly forgotten and ought to be brought back into print. Uh, and I don't know. The more I get these kinds of books, the more I think about it. I certainly have right now in my possession enough primary documentation to go ahead with such a project. I, I certainly do that. And, and with proper sanitation precautions and social distancing and face masking, I have... The Boston Athenaeum, I have the, the Boston Historical Society, the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Boston Society. The, all of that stuff is located within 30 yards of each other in a place where I go two or three times a week. So I, it, whatever I don't have here, I could certainly get fairly easily. And that's tempting. I admit that's tempting. I have a couple of other literary projects that I'm trying to work on, but that's tempting. You know, the, the standard uh, dictum for so many writers over the, the last century has been uh, that one of the yardsticks you can use to know whether or not you should devote the effort, set, set aside the time to write a certain book, is if it doesn't already exist. Write the book you want to read. Write the book you want to read. And if that book doesn't exist, then write it. Because <laughs> you won't be the last person who will want to read it. There is something to that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We shall see. But in the meantime, uh, that was my brattle trip for today. So let's do uh, 
let's do a Steve Pyramid, and this will be it'll be tricky because they're all heavy hardcovers, but that's all right. Books are a light burden. So we have a two volume Life and Letters of, of Edward Everett Hale. Uh, we have the, a, an illustrated hardcover translation of uh, The Travels of Marco Polo. We have World Poetry, a poetry anthology that I cannot recommend strongly enough. Oh, my. Uh, we have Book of Birds, a 100-year-old uh, illustrated guide from the uh, uh, National Geographic. We have an illustrated version of The Song of Hiawatha, really nice color and black and white illustration. We have The Life and Letters of Henry Lee Higginson a Boston impresario who is totally forgotten today. We have a commemoration of the centenary of the birth of James Russell Lowell, <laughs> which I would only find at the Brattle. And then, wait, where are the mass markets? Okay, yes. And then two Murder, Inc. paperbacks, including one by the creator of uh, Winnie the Pooh. So, <laughs> so I've got some murder mystery reading in store for me as well, as well as a whole lot of Boston stuff, <laughs> of old Boston stuff. Fine by me. Absolutely fine by me. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to wrap this up for now. Another long brattle nail hall, a book haul. Sorry about that. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.